I do want to tell you a little bit about why we're doing this program. First of all, it's National Aphasia Awareness Month, but also at Planet Word, uh, we have these sort of auxiliary exhibits called beacons. We call them beacons. So if you've been to the museum, you know there's sort of a central exhibit in each gallery. And then along the walls, there are interactive screens and beautiful ornate frames that are a deeper dive into something that is pedagogically related to the main exhibit. And we've just uh, launched a new uh, beacon on word finding and aphasia. And a lot of the folks on tonight's panel were instrumental in helping us put that together. So uh, both because of the Awareness Month, because of our new beacon, we thought it was time to talk about this timely topic. And given how many of you were interested in registering, I think you'll agree that it's important. Um, that is uh, a lot of introduction. <laughs> and I'm going to beg your pardon one more second while I introduce all of these smart people who have joined me this evening. Uh, Peter Turkeltaub is the medical director of the Center for Aphasia Research and Rehabilitation at Georgetown University Medical Center. Um, Mike Settles is here. He is a stroke survivor. He's been experiencing aphasia and word finding issues himself. He's also um, featured in our word finding beacon in the museum. And here to support him um, are his wife, Teresa Settles and his sister, Andrea Settles. And also Susan Coyle is here. She's a speech language pathologist and executive director of the Stroke Comeback Center. Mike's been working with the Stroke Comeback Center um, to help address some of his work finding issues. Welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having um, me. Peter Turkeltaub, I'm gonna start with you. Can you just give us some basic definitions? First of all, what is aphasia? Uh, sure, uh, um, aphasia is a disorder um, that affects a person's ability to use language to communicate, um, basically. <clears throat> and it's caused by an injury or some other kind of problem with the parts of the brain that we use for language. Um, so those parts of the brain and most people are on the, the left side. So it can be caused by a stroke or a brain tumor or an injury or sometimes neurodegenerative diseases, any kind of problem that affects those parts of the brain that we use for language can cause aphasia. Um, so if aphasia is a problem with communication and using language to communicate. Um, people with aphasia still have the same ideas um, in their head that they have always had, just like everyone else, um, but it affects their ability to connect those ideas to words or to sentences. And so it looks a little bit different in every individual person who has aphasia. Um, most people with aphasia, pretty much everybody, have uh, some problems finding, uh, finding their words when they need them. Um, a lot of people will have difficulty forming fluent sentences. Um, some people don't. Some people can uh, form fluent sentences. They have a sort of natural flow of speech, but each individual word may be jumbled up. Uh, some people have difficulty understanding what other people say. Other people can understand uh, perfectly well. Uh, some people have reading and writing uh, problems. That's very common as well. So it looks a little bit different in each individual person and it can affect their lives in, in different ways. And, and how much do we know about how language works in the brain? How sophisticated is that research? Well, it's ongoing. Um, so we've learned a lot. We started learning about this actually in the 1800s um, by some neurologists um, looking at uh, the brains of people who had aphasia. And that was where we really first started to understand how the, the brain does language. Um, and then there's been a lot more research over the past um, 30 years or so. We have new brain imaging methods that we can use to look at things like the activity of the brain while people are um, reading sentences or finding words or doing other things that one needs to do with language. Um, and so it's an evolving field. We understand a lot more than we used to um, about how the brain does language, but there's still a lot more to understand. And so what is going on in the brain in someone with aphasia? Um, well, so the, the typically most people are going to use the left side of the brain and in particular the temporal and the frontal lobes of the left side and to a lesser degree the parietal lobe and, and other parts of the brain as well um, uh, to, to do language. And so that involves a lot of different uh, things, uh, calling to mind words, coming up with the sounds of words in your head, um, turning those sounds into speech uh, motor plans. 
um, understanding speech, reading is a, um, is a related um, um, ability. And all of that relies on um, different individual parts of the, of the brain, usually mostly on the left um, side. And in a person with aphasia, um, there's been some damage or some um, dysfunction in those parts of the brain. And so in people with aphasia, um, the network that they uh, learned to use language with growing up isn't working quite right. And they have to start to rely on other parts of the brain that didn't learn to do language growing up. And so naturally those parts of the brain aren't gonna be quite as good at it. And um, they're not gonna be as efficient and they may do things not quite the, the way that the person is intending. Um, so a person may have, a, may have an idea in their mind and they're trying to pull the word uh, to mind and maybe they come up with a word that's kind of like the word that they meant, but it's not quite the right word. It might be dog for cat or the sounds might be a little bit uh, jumbled. Um, so that's basically what's happening. You mentioned that in most people, it's the left side of the brain. Why not everybody? Well, there's a few people um, here and there who use both sides of the brain or the right side. Um, and I should clarify, there are some language functions that the right side does. So the, the things that the left side does really well are things like uh, syntax or grammar and phonology, the sounds of, uh, of language, um, the individual speech sounds. The right side does uh, something that we call emotional prosody. So it's the intonation of your voice that conveys emotion. That's more rely, relies more on the right side. So it, it is a little bit divided in everybody, but, but the things that we think of as the sort of central aspects of language are on the left in most people. In about um, 95 or more percent of people who are right-handed, it's on the left. And in about um, three quarters of people who are left-handed, it's still on the left. But there's a handful of people here and there who have language on the right side of the brain. Um, and so yeah, as a neurologist, occasionally we will see people who have a brain injury like a stroke on the right side of the brain and have aphasia, but it's, but it's unusual. Um, we have somebody ask which side of the brain controls when people are singing. I assume she means singing, not signing. Uh, so uh, I'll answer both. Um, so sign language is a language like any other uh, language. Um, it's not a verbal uh, spoken uh, language, but it has all the other features of, um, of every other language. And it relies on the left hemisphere the same way that spoken language um, does. And there are people, uh, deaf native signers who develop aphasia that looks very much like um, uh, spoken aphasia uh, from an injury on the left side of the brain. Okay, singing uh, does rely more on the right side um, because it is sort of the same kind of circuitry that's involved in that intonation, the emotional prosody that I mentioned before. And we think that processing of things like melodies relies more on the right hemisphere. Interesting. Uh, the person asking the question clarified, she did in fact mean singing. Okay. Um, because she has a relative <laughs> who experiences word finding problems, but sings clearly. I see, yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty common in, in people with certain types of aphasia. Um, Mike Suttles, I want to bring you into the conversation yes. um, because now we've sort of understood the, the medical aspects of it, but tell us about the personal aspects. What is it like to live with aphasia? All right. Um, well, it's, uh, it was um, jumbled. Yeah. Um, jumbled and um, it's... Uh, um, it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. And, um, numbers, you know, are too, but, um, you know, but, but it was, um, one, two years ago, um, I can't walk, write, read, um, you know, I was, uh, um, I had, um, is it, um, is it, um, uh, paralyzed? Is it, is it a, yeah paralyzed left brain um and i had it it was um one two three five six seven clots um so but but um <laughs> so uh years ago i, I, I it, not now now it's i mean it's coming but but it, but it's, it's hard it's it, it's hard though yeah and and what have you found helpful? Oh man, 
<laughs> um, uh, family, uh, friends, community, um, and uh, let's say one, two, three, four, five. Um, uh, uh, um, what up? Uh, it's um, I'll, I'll, I can't just say it. It's um. Uh, Class, yeah, class, <laughs> class. Um, so, you know, but but um, but but it's, it's, you know, it's it's hard, but um, it's coming. But you know, um, oh oh oh, oh too. I said um, uh, um, is it um, apps apps? Yeah, that was this one. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yes. Well, what, when you just got on your phone and put in your earbud, what were you doing? How was that helpful? Yes. All right. Um, it, it's. I'll tell you. It's um, like uh, it, it's um, uh, Google um, Google Lens, or um, this one. It, it's um. <laughs> <laughs> now it's now it's um this one uh, yeah 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 but it's a it's an app that you use that sort of provides backup yeah uh, speak for yeah. me speak for me yeah speak uh -huh. you know so now now it's you know it's it's helping you know, helping yes yeah. Uh -huh. yeah oh what an extraordinary long way you've come right yeah. um. And and Teresa, tell us what, as as a family member, what has been helpful to you to understand how to support Mike. Um, the biggest thing is honestly a lot of this trial and error, um, really being patient. Um, just because when I think I get it, then I got it, it may not work the next day. So it's really just, of course, knowing Mike. Um, biggest, I mean the biggest thing he's so determined so he kind of makes it a little easier but just again just knowing him being patient um realizing kind of maybe try to always kind of think one step ahead like what he may need to help him to communicate better such as like maybe leaving notepads in every room um if he uh, um keep routines in place um a lot of um just not really assuming that he understands making sure that it's con I'm con you know maybe check back in just to make sure so what you meant was this just to make sure so to eliminate any possibility of confusion um the great thing with Mike Mike isn't isn't a true advocate so if he doesn't understand he will say I don't understand so again just being patient and repeating and just being open and, and when I don't understand the same thing I'm not sure what you're asking so I think that's really helped so um again just being very open um confirming his confirming his under, the understanding both ways so um yeah things of that nature and then we, again people you know everyone from the stroke come back to working with a speech pathologist and just reaching out and pulling from different resources like that's really has helped and and why notebooks what mike can you sometimes think to write a word when you can't think to speak it uh yes so um i can i can see it but um I, read it or I um I have um like uh jumbled I, I have um you know I can read it and, and I I can uh, speak it too you know but yeah but um yeah sometimes it just be a matter of just giving him that that one word to jump start what he's saying uh huh we'll just kind of run with it right yeah would you agree with that Andrea how have you been able to support Mike I would, Teresa said a lot of the things I do. I've got notepads all over the house um, because when he's thinking of a word, you, you know, while he's thinking it, you don't want him wasting time searching to, to write it down. So that helps. Um, but also when we communicate, we, we usually talk on FaceTime because with Mike, um, like Teresa said, he's very determined, but you can tell, you can, he can almost tell himself, he'll self-correct. You know, if he's trying to say a certain word, 
and what comes out isn't what he says, you can tell it on his face, you know, and um, being patient and allowing him the space to say what he is trying to say helps, not finishing his words or not um, speaking very fast, um, you know, kind of like Teresa was saying, make, making sure you're doing that check-in to see, are you with me or not? Um, th those have really helped. And do you have to train yourself not to finish the sentences? Yeah. Was that your instinct to jump in? Yes, initially, yes. Um, in the beginning, it, you, you thought it was helpful, but it actually, you could tell it frustrated him more um, because that's, you know, you're probably thinking one thing and he's thinking something else. And then he would shut down and then just say, well, that's okay. And so you had to literally learn, you know, be patient. He's going to get it. Um, and sometimes he'll get stuck. And one thing that helps uh, Mike is to think of the opposite word. So if you can't think of, I'm trying to get you to say hot, if I say cold, then that'll trigger it. So it's, it's certain things um, that will also help too. Wow, isn't that interesting? Mike, how did you figure that out, that the opposite helps? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. It was, um, um, I don't know. It, it's like um, opposite. So I, I can like um, dog, uh, cat, or um, like uh, um, uh, uh, son and daughter. Yeah, he, he's here. Yeah, but I had to, I, I, I can see it, but I don't know. But um, I was, I was, um, uh, one, it, was, it said, um, um, you were, um, it was, uh, uh patience, patience is, 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 is virtual. Um, I had, um, uh, doctors, I had, a, I had a doctor, right? He was, he was, um, uh, he, he was, he was, he was, I was, I was, I was here, but she was, um, uh, um uh, uh white white so he was he was here and I, i'm i'm i i i i can i'm here but she's like i said i'm here you know but you know you, you had to um patience you know you, you, patience and um yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah, Teresa. Um, and it was, and it, it was even a little bit frustrating for me because the doctor would come into the room and the appointment would be, it was for Mike, but they were asking me questions about Mike instead of allowing him the opportunity to speak for himself. Mm. So things like that, it's just really um, just, you know, uh, being mindful when others aren't, um, because even with, you know, the phage and I won't go too far into it, but just, you know, like I said, he's an advocate, he's, you know, he will... He may not always know what he wants to say, but at least provide the opportunity and then he'll kind of figure it out. So I can tell like that was the, um, it wasn't a great doctor's appointment, I'll just say that. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 and the person wouldn't stop. I mean, just like a routine checkup, but so how's he feeling today? Like what's going on? And she just kept walking back and forth as if he wasn't there. So that's the main thing. It's just you know, remembering, you know, he, he is there, he's, you know, very present, he's very involved in this, in this process. So just, you know, not, people aren't always mindful, but just kind of pulling back and allow him to, you know, to, to speak on his own behalf, advocate for himself. Yeah. Suzanne Coyle, I want to bring you into this conversation because we mentioned that um, Mike and other uh, folks experiencing aphasia can benefit from speech pathology. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that treatment and how it works for aphasia? Sure. So the first thing we do when a person with aphasia comes to see a speech language pathologist or often called a speech therapist is we do a good language assessment because aphasia is so different in each individual person. And we look at how the aphasia has impact the four different modalities of language. So the talking, the listening, the reading, and the writing. And then depending on how those skills are, we can use some good treatments to improve those skills. But we also know that that improvement of skills takes a long time. And so as the Settles family has so uh, well described here today, a lot of what we do in speech therapy is working on strategies. 
There's so many strategies that can help people with aphasia communicate more efficiently and more effectively. And so that's what we spend a lot of our time in speech therapy working on as well. And some of them are really simple. Sometimes you have to tell someone, if you can't think of the word, use a different word. Um, give me a gesture. Can you write it down? These are different ways of communicating. And Mike's had years of practice communicating in different ways. But for a new person with aphasia, it's unusual, you know, they go to say something and it doesn't work. So you have to help them through finding a different way to communicate that message. Um, and then another really important part of, of the speech therapy process is incorporating the family. So communication doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, it takes at least two people to communicate. And so it's so important that family members or care partners or friends are involved in that therapeutic process as well. So they can learn things like, um, how to help somebody use one of these strategies that we've been practicing in therapy. Or um, most important thing, don't pretend you understand something when you don't. Um, that will come back and bite you. Um, so the family is really important part of the therapy also. So um, another thing I'll say that, um, you know, we know that aphasia takes a long time to improve. This is a long road to recovery. And it's also a normal part of the therapeutic process that sometimes someone does speech therapy for a while, and then maybe they take a break and they live their life for a little while. And, um, you know, it, during that time, language skills continue to improve, strategies are being used, and then maybe they go back and they do some more speech therapy down the road. So I wouldn't want someone to think that just because they finished their first round of speech therapy, that's all they're ever going to get because it's a long process and speech language pathologists are here to help you through this. And, and what is the prognosis for people with aphasia? Obviously, it's a it's a complicated disorder that evidences itself differently in different patients, but in general. In, yeah, um, good question. Um, I think it varies in everyone. Um, one thing that we look at is what's the origin of the aphasia. So if the origin is the result of a neurological disease, um, like a primary progressive aphasia or another form of dementia, then we know that we're maybe trying to preserve language, train some strategies, train the family, maybe slow decline. That's different than what is more common, which is when aphasia is the result of a stroke or a brain injury. And what we know that the research is telling us now is that brain can continue to improve indefinitely if people are given good support, good motivation, and good services. So while some people think, oh my gosh, this is going to take forever, that's actually a really good thing. It means you have forever. So your brain can continue to heal and language can continue to improve um, as long as people keep working on it and keep staying motivated. And it's interesting, Peter, that you mentioned that people find a new pathway for language. So it's not necessarily repairing the old one. It's training your brain to circuit things a different route. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on the cause, like Suzanne was just was just saying. So um, when a person has a stroke, for instance, um, there's a piece of the brain that is that is lost. And so you have to rely on what's left. And um, so in, in that case, there is some opportunity to repair the tissue sort of around the area of the stroke, but um, most of the recovery is gonna rely on just the, 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 the rest of the brain. Um, and so we can sort of think of that as compensation um, or, or something like that. In other people, um, the, the whole brain is, is there and there's a problem with individual cells um, and so in, in that case, we don't really understand it quite as, uh, quite as well, but we think that sort of other populations of cells in the same parts of the brain might start to, um, to take on uh, functions that maybe they didn't, they didn't do before um, to some degree. So it, it varies a little bit by the cause. Um, there is some restoration of function. So one thing that happens when you have an injury of the brain is that that injury doesn't just affect the area that's been injured. The brain is like a complicated electrical circuit. And so an injury in one part of the brain will cause other parts of the brain that are connected um, to not work quite right for a while. And we know that part of recovery involves the, the network sort of 
um, rebalancing itself. Um, and so those parts of the brain that are connected start to work better over time. We don't completely understand how that happens yet, but it has to do with new synapses forming and, and other new connections forming in the brain. There are a lot of folks in the chat, I think, who are experiencing aphasia and uh, are impressed with you, Mike, because of how far you've come. What, um, what do you want people to know about what it's like to experience what you're experiencing? Well, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> um, intelligence, right? But you know, I have a law degree in um, uh, finance, but now I have to, I have to, um, uh, and now it, I have, it's on um, uh, this one, it's um, uh, this one. Uh, one grade now and now I had to think I had to you know I now now it's hard but 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 uh it's um but it's it's coming but you know but um one two years ago I you know I, I can't but now now I, I I can see you know um 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 uh, reading now and I have a um uh, Kindle I, I can is it hearing is it hearing yeah yeah so um you know but you know, but 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 it's but it's it's a hard, <laughs> but we want to, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, your attitude is impressive, Andrea. How would you answer that question? What do you want people to know? Uh, so it's good, like Mike said. It, it things take time. Um, I remember literally when he first came home from the hospital, and it was. He had to learn how to say certain words to the point of knowing where your tongue needs to be placed to say a word that starts with a K versus a T or an S. And to get from that point all the way till now where he is speaking in sentences, um, it, the patience is definitely key for anyone. Um, uh, picture books are good to use to point to, to certain things, especially in the in the um, uh, beginning phase. But then there are things that you can also do um, just at home, have fun in learning. So for example, we love to play games. Um, Uno is a good game to play. You've got your numbers and colors. And so you're still having fun, but at the same time, you know, Mike can engage with us and also play and, and learning as well. Um, but one other thing I would say too is, you know, being so determined, you also have to know when to take a break and you, allowing the patients to get the work done, but also knowing at the end of the day, okay, it's time to relax and let your brain rest some. <laughs> and someone who is as determined as Mike um, sometimes he'll try to keep going and keep going and keep studying and you almost have to tell him, okay, Mike, you've done enough today. <laughs> Let's relax. <laughs> so it, it's also just practicing, you know, that level of patience too. You know, it, there are so many aspects to this and, and not just the neurological aspects of memory and, uh, syntax and grammar and emotion and tonality, but I didn't even think about the actual physicality of forming the letters. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, you talked about speech therapy, but it, I guess I didn't quite put the pieces together that that can mean literally your tongue goes here to make this kind of a plosive consonant. Yeah, so, you know, um, our, our professional titles is speech language pathologists. We work with both speech and language but everybody calls what we do speech therapy. So in people with aphasia, a lot of it is language based, but we're working on that word retrieval and how words go together. A lot of people with aphasia also have a different diagnosis called apraxia. And in those situations, that's um, what we call a motor speech disorder. So for them, they know the word they wanna say, they've retrieved it. They can't get the muscles to coordinate to pronounce that word. And um, oftentimes people have both diagnoses, which um, can be extra challenging. Um, so we do work with 
getting the sounds in the right, the, the muscles in the right position, get the sounds to produce correctly. Um, we have a whole ton of questions from the audience, and I want to make sure we get to as many of them as we can. Well, I want to. Um, oh yeah, Mike, go ahead. Which um, I was um, I want I want to um, um, like uh, um, kids. Kids. So I, I, we have a uh, kids, right? Um, kids. You know, I, I want I want um, Gabby to talk. Just you know, I want to talk. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So you know, have a talk. Um, I would say patience is definitely key, but at first, uh, we would like watch movies and play games and definitely what Andrea said, like playing Uno and card games and like Phase 10 um, and bingo, and then watching movies with him. Uh, we would put on the subtitles just to make it easier, or we would go to the movie theaters. So the first year, it wasn't it wasn't challenging. It was just a, we had to adjust to different circumstances. And um, um uh, Gabby, she, she she was she was um uh, patient. So she she was reading, and she was patient, and she was reading. Yeah. Yeah, I would read like the picture books, like the books that I had when I was younger. And then I would read and hear repeat the sentence. And then we would like sing the alphabet. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually they moved on to, or moved on to reading newspaper articles like US um, news because the articles were sh shorter. So also just keeping like a, with the normal routine, exposing him to, you know, cause he's big on news, he's big on sports. So, you know, making sure like he knows what's going on in the world of sports or what's happening in the news. He's a big news buff. So, um, you know, reading a newspaper article then following up with the questions, all the things that we kind of learned just from um, speech pathologists and just kind of learning on our own. And Gabby would read with him. And I think that played a, uh, that played a, a huge part in his recovery as well. So again, just being very open-minded and finding new things, I would say. Uh-huh. And, and you must have had to sort of keep adapting, right? Like, yeah. like you said, something that might've worked last week, you need something different this week. Yes. And again, just allowing him, um, giving him a space to grow and learn and figure, you know, a little, you know, a couple of things out. And again, like the trial and everything, just, there's no, I don't think there's really any wrong. Yeah. Um, okay, let's try to get through some of these questions because people have a lot to ask. Uh, Peter, this one's for you. Is aphasia different for multilingual people? I had a TBI, traumatic brain injury, years ago, and it feels like all my language cards have been shuffled together. I can find the word in a language different than the one I'm using for conversation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so aphasia typically will affect every language that a person has, but it can to varying degrees with different languages. And the usual pattern is that the language uh, a person learned first and uses most often will be the least affected. Um, and the language that they use most after the stroke, like in therapy and at home, will recover uh, most. That pattern can be a little different across uh, individual uh, people, but that's the most typical pattern that we see. Now, in um, people who speak multiple languages and switch between them a lot in different contexts, um, that requires something that's called executive control to select the right language at the right time. And that can also be affected sometimes and it can cause problems with, with uh, switching between languages. Uh, Suzanne, this is a question for you. Um, as a speech language pathologist, I see speech apraxia together with aphasia very often. Can you talk a bit about treating them both, which to focus on first or how to deal with both? Well, I think, um, you know, that's something that, again, it depends on the, the individual um, and the degrees to which uh, an apraxia may be more significant or the aphasia more, may be more significant. You know, I think in cases where they are both very significant, then, you know, I personally start with finding a way for this person to communicate. So um, communicate some 
basic needs, some yes and no's, some uh, way to, to control their environment. And whether that's communicating it with speech or communicating it with a book or bo a communication board or um, an app, but starting with that, regardless of it's, if it's the aphasia or if it's the apraxia, finding a, a way for them to communicate that basic information. Um, the other thing that I would think too is that sometimes when it's hard to decide, do you address the apraxia more or the aphasia more? We also think, well, if we could uh, erase the apraxia, would this person have um, those word retrieval skills to communicate their, their thoughts? And oftentimes, no. So then um, we work on some of both. You know, we work on improving the language skills and those uh, word retrieval skills and also work on the, the motor speech. It's really challenging when people have both aphasia and apraxia and how to guide um, the therapy so that you're really addressing both. Um, so that's, a, that's a, long, a long way of saying it depends on the person. And I wish there was an easier answer to the question, but there's really not. Well, I mean, I think what's been very clear from everything we've talked about is that uh, the brain is complicated. <laughs> uh, individual effects from brain injury are complicated. And, uh, you know, one size can't possibly fit all. Uh, this is a little bit of a one size fits all question. Somebody's asking, are the first three months after a stroke still critical for starting therapy? or is the lifelong progress adding more options? Suzanne, you want um, to So I, I think either Suzanne or I could take yeah. that. I, do you want, I'll, I'll go first and maybe you yeah, can you add. go first. Okay, yeah, so um, the, the answer to that question is a little bit complicated. Um, so we do see the most improvement in language early on the first few months, um, but people, like Suzanne said earlier, people don't stop improving from aphasia ever. Um, you see people improving with speech therapy years and years after the stroke. Um, and there's the, the jury is still out on whether there's a difference in the effectiveness of therapy given early versus late. We know for a fact that therapy works, and we know that it works at any time that you give it. Um, but there's kind of mixed evidence. Um, in, in the speech therapy literature, there's in the medical literature on aphasia also, there actually isn't enough evidence to say that it's more effective in the first few months than it is uh, later on. It's effective at both times. I agree with you, Peter. The one thing I would just add is that I think it's also important for therapy to happen at the time that it's right for the person to participate it and tolerate it participate in it and tolerate it. And I know in those initial three months, there can be major medical issues going on. There can be, you know, somebody has to find an, um, a new way to live, a new place to live, you know, have the, the support that um, they need to be safe in their home environment. So there's just so much going on in those first three months. And I think at the same time, families are often pressured to like hammer the therapy when, when the, the person isn't necessarily ready for that. But if things you know, get a little bit more stable that down the road, they might be more responsive to that um, intensive therapy. And, and along with that, I mean, it, just to complement that, I would say that um, the nature of the therapy often is gonna be different early on versus late uh, because the needs are gonna be so different. Um, Mike, this is a question for you. Someone writes, how did you practice or rehearse increasing your communication? And do you find it easier to speak to strangers or to friends and family? Uh, well, um, <laughs> um, strangers, I mean, I, I, I don't care. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can, I can talk, so I can talk or, or um, friends too, you know, um, what was the um question what what <laughs> how how did you practice oh um practice oh man it's um <laughs> you know it's um uh, it's um uh, man it's, it's it's um uh, oh yeah uh, I'm thinking it's um it's hard but you um Oh, uh, study, yeah, study, um, numbers, um, read, or, or, or I have, um, um, uh, is it 
intense. Ten um, therapy, yeah. There was this one, um, friends, and but um, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's 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 hard. You can say it. Um, uh, weed or IAPS. IAPS, yeah. Worksheets, um, books, uh, workbooks, so things of, of that nature. Yeah. A lot of workbooks, a lot of worksheets. And um, in um, uh, this one, I mean, it, I mean, it, 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 I mean, this one, it's um. <laughs> but you know it's um sam i am you know you know but yeah um it's it's you gotta um it's not it's not one time you got to study so uh i don't know yeah ongoing yeah um somebody asks this is for you suzanne i'd like to hear more about the stroke comeback center Oh, sure. So we're a nonprofit organization. It's, uh, we're in, our headquarters are here in Vienna, Virginia, which is outside of Washington, DC. And we provide ongoing support to stroke survivors and their families. And most of the people that participate in our programs do have aphasia. And people can come to us at any point in their recoveries and they can stay with us for as long as they like. And we do almost all of our work in small groups that we call classes. We have classes here in our Vienna Center. We have a center in Rockville, Maryland. And then we also have a virtual center that's open to people that live in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. But we're big believers that um, aphasia does continue to recover and improve with time and with hard work. And um, that's what we do here at Stroke Comeback Center. But we also have a lot of fun, don't we, Mike? Uh, yes, <laughs> right. Right. we do, because we also are big believers that it's important to live your life with aphasia. And um, there's so much power in meeting other people that have aphasia, both for the people with aphasia, but also for the families and knowing that they're not alone. And people with aphasia are by far the best resources for new strategies. I mean, the first time I met Mike, and he pulled out his phone and he used his app. I was immediately grabbed my phone. I said, what is that app? I don't know that one. <laughs> um, so, and family members are the best resources for um, more therapy programs and for um, strategies that help at home too. So we really believe in the power of connection. Um, and we're fortunate here in the DC area to have Stroke Comeback Center but I would encourage people with aphasia to find um, maybe an aphasia support group or another community aphasia center in your area and get connected with other people that have aphasia. There are lots of online programs, but there are also programs um, in communities around the country. And, and what about for family members? Andrea, has it been valuable for you to meet other folks going through this? It is because honestly, until Mike had aphasia, I didn't even know what it was or after I learned about it, I realized people in school um, that I talked with had aphasia, just didn't know what that was. Um, so it, it opens up your eyes when you meet other people. Um, it, it also makes you realize, um, um, you know, just making sure that I'm not speaking too fast for, you know, for other folks that I'm meeting as well. So, or, or making sure I'm kind of checking in and looking at their um, nonverbal cues to see, are they understanding or, you know, have they checked out or not? So, so overall, I, I think it, it, it helps too. Um, we have a question, Peter, I think you should take this one. Are there medical treatments for aphasia? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, the answer is not really. So there, there's no um, medical treatment that has the kind of multi-center randomized controlled trial that you'd really like to see to say that there's an effective medical treatment for aphasia. Um, there are small studies showing that certain medicines may be able to help uh, with word finding. Um, and so I have a clinic where I see people with aphasia and we do sometimes try those medicines. Um, 
but it's off-label use of the medicine. Um, there's a lot of research on brain stimulation techniques um, to try to improve aphasia. So very mild, non-invasive forms of electrical or magnetic stimulation, brain stimulation. Um, and lots of small trials suggest that that may be a little bit helpful, but we don't have any of the big definitive trials yet to prove um, that it's helpful. Um, so one of the things that I do with most of my time is um, research um, to try to understand the problem, uh, the brain basis of language, why people have aphasia, what makes each person who has aphasia different, um, how do people recover from aphasia, so that we can try to develop these kinds of, uh, of treatments. Um, but unfortunately, right now, there's nothing that I would um, say as a sort of standard medical, medically recommended treatment for aphasia. I do wanna plug um, one thing that's been mentioned in the chat a couple of times, which is the National Aphasia Association, which is uh, the main organization in the United States that advocates for people with aphasia and provides resources uh, for people with aphasia and tries to raise aphasia awareness. Um, so that website is aphasia.org. Great. That, that's also a great way to find a community, uh, an aphasia community in your own neighborhood. Um, we've also had a couple of questions about the apps that Mike is using. Mike put it in the chat. One is Speak For Me with the number four, and one is Google Lens. Um, so those are written down in the chat as well. Mike, this is a question for you. Um, it says, when someone has aphasia, are your thoughts jumbled or are you thinking clearly and it's expressing it that's the challenge? It, it's both ways. Um, I have, um, I, I can, I can, I can read it, but I, I can't speak it, one, <laughs> or I can um, uh, speak it and repeat it too. Uh, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, um, uh, you know, it's um, both, yeah, or, um, or um, I can, um, I can, uh, I, um, uh, is it, um, is it, uh, Photo. Photo. Now, oh, okay. Now I can see it, or or um, if I have uh, am I, if I um, um listening, I, I I can't see it now. I can I I can um read it now. Oh, okay. Now you know it's it's, it's, it's you know, um one. Well, it's not that's what it's it's, it's it's one. It's two, three, four. You know. Yeah. Somebody is asking, and I think this is probably you, Peter, but maybe Suzanne the connection between the sort of tendency to lose words as you age and aphasia. When do you know that it's crossed on over from just not quite putting your finger on the right word to something more pathological? You want me to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. Is that, yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's natural um, that as we uh, age, all of us have more trouble getting to uh, words that we need. And it tends to be uh, words that we use less often, words that we used learned later in life, um, or words for very specific things like people's names, uh, for example, especially people's names that we don't see every day. Um, and that's natural. Um, it has to do with the, the aging of, of the brain and, the, and changes in um, memory systems, for example, as we, uh, as we age. It's different um, than a person who has aphasia because there's not a, there's not a damage or an injury to the brain that, um, that causes it. Um, now, it, there are disorders that, um, Suzanne mentioned this earlier, called primary progressive aphasia. And there's other kinds of neurodegenerative disorders that do cause what we would consider pathological um, uh, progressive changes in the brain, and those can cause larger word finding problems and also other kinds of problems that look more like aphasia. Sometimes it, it can be a little difficult to tell at the very, very early stage whether it's natural aging or it's one of these kinds of problems, um, but over time it becomes more, more clear. Anything to add to that, Suzanne? No, uh, no, I would just well, I would just add that if it gets to the point that um, someone is having a hard time communicating to meet their daily needs, or you know if they're working, or if it's disrupting the flow of their life, then absolutely just get it, you know, just get it checked. 
Um, and it may become apparent with time that um, if it's really disrupting their ability to do what they want to do, um, talk to your doctor. Um, somebody's asking, I think this is a really interesting question about ways to deal with depression experienced by a person with aphasia. I imagine it's wildly frustrating. Um, Teresa, I don't know if you want to take that on, if that's something that you've seen with Mike or um, Andrea. Um, initially, we you know, did see a lot who we, there was a little bit of mood swings. Um, I think that came a little bit from frustration. Um, when he first came home, he was, they provided him with medicine. Um, we, but mostly Mike, did not, we didn't want it, it to be a way of life. So we, and, and mainly Mike, again, weaned himself off of it. And again, it was just, uh, had to be patient with that and go through the most, you know, go through the, the changes because again, he's still trying to figure things out. So that's where that patience comes in and just kind of watching and being supportive. And, and it was the best thing that we probably could have done, but there are days where I do recognize that, you know, he is frustrated and, but just like any of us with anything. So it's, it's understandable, but just knowing when to seek help is very important. So again, just knowing him and knowing when he needs help, but um, just paying attention to any big changes. Um, the great thing what, what Mike does is he works out a lot um, to avoid things like that. I mean, also just to stay healthy, but mainly to avoid. For me, it's very important for him to work out, um, diet, you know, making sure he's going outside. So those things to avoid any chance of a depress depression happening, um, which I have, as Andrea said, I have coworkers who have gone through this and um, and they're seeing it, they're going through it. So again, it's just keeping the person active and making sure like he's going to the gym, he's going out with the kids, he's riding his bike, he's um, you know, going to their games, all of that. To, so again, to try to avoid that just being very active. Mm -hmm. yeah. Suzanne, what would you add to that with coping strategies? Well, I, I think it's important to know that, it, that depression is really common in stroke survivors and people with aphasia. And, you know, if we think about it, somebody's life changed very dramatically, very suddenly. Um, and there are huge, there's a huge amount of loss that comes with it. Um, you know, a loss in a professional role, a loss of relationships. Um, and, you know, it can be a loss within a family structure. And it's important to recognize that that is a piece of this um, recovery is recognizing the loss and recognizing that depression can be a part of that. And then also when we think about um, people without aphasia, you know, what's the first thing that we recommend somebody do when they're experiencing depression is get help, get, ther get therapy, um, those mental health services. And that's so challenging for a person with aphasia because that all happens through language. It's hard to find a provider that um, is able to work with a person with aphasia. And it's hard for a person with aphasia to communicate those very complex feelings and emotions that are often discussed in traditional therapy settings. So I'm, I'm glad whoever put the question in the chat, thank you for bringing that really important issue to this discussion. Um, because I think the more that we talk about mental health, whether it's with people with aphasia or people without, um, the more we'll normalize it and um, get people help they need. Sure. I just add that I, I completely agree with everything uh, that Suzanne just said. I just want to add in that as an adjunct, um, so so some people with aphasia can um, participate in in talk therapy, and it can be very very helpful. Um, and whether or not a person can, there are uh, medicines that can help with depression. The medicines that help with major depression also work for people who have depression as a result of stroke, um, and they can be very very helpful um, in some people. So seeking the help is really the, the first step. And then um, there's, there's lots of ways to, to help. Um, we are almost out of time, but Mike, I want to give you the last word because um, you're, you know, the person experienced all of this firsthand. Um, if somebody is just dipping their toe into this world, they've got a family member diagnosed, they've got a diagnosis themselves. What, what is your advice? What would you want people to come away from this program understanding? 
Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm a, you were just um, depression. Is it depression? Right. Yes. Yeah, but um, you know, it, you know, it, it's hard because you know, it change. You know, change. But now you you have to um, um, uh, family, friends. You know, um, helping or um, you know, uh, walking or something. But um, that as one, um, two, it's like um, uh, um, patience. The the family or friends patience. Because, you know, because um, two years ago, yeah, yeah, I don't, you don't, you know, you, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. So yeah, you know, patience is uh, key. Um, and, and one, two, it's like, you know, um, you have to um, advocate, yeah, advocate. So um, apps or um, uh, Kindle, reading or um uh is it um uh, therapy um friends community or um groups you know like um stroke combat you know group or i have um a class is um of maryland too in group two you know or you know um you know yeah i have i have i have i have one two three four five strokes you know but 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 but, it, but I'm I'm just telling you it, it's, it's hard I'm just telling you you know <laughs> and so it's, it's hard you know yeah. well thank you so much Mike Settles for sharing your story with us and Teresa Settles and Andrea Settles being here uh, to support Mike and Suzanne Coyle and Peter Turkletop thank you so much for joining us this evening and thank you everyone for participating and um, we look forward to seeing you at Planet Word or at another virtual program soon. Good night.